Welcome to the North Coast Journal Preview, where we take a look at the stories being followed in the upcoming edition of the North Coast Journal. I'm your host, Dave Frank, and I'm joined by North Coast Journal's Arts and Features Editor, Jennifer Fromico Cahill, and North Coast Journal Staff Writer, Iridion Casares. Welcome, guys. How are you doing? Well, guys, it uh, looks like uh, we got some sunshine today in between weeks of rain, so let's take advantage and... Uh, and uh, be, be uh, stoked that we get at least a little bit of daylight, sunlight on our in our lives. Yes, mm-hmm. take your newspaper outside. Read the journal <laughs> exactly. outside. Exactly. Um, Iridion, why don't you let us? Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the story that uh, you you've written for this week's edition? Yeah. So this week I wrote about uh, Humboldt State University's push to become a polytechnic university, um, and so a polytechnic university like Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and Cal Poly Pomona are universities that have a focus on STEM degrees. So like natural sciences, engineering, technology, and applied sciences. So HSU is hoping to become one of these institutions. And and in the Cal State system, there's only those two. Um, So it would if it's granted the designation, it would become the third polytechnic um, in the Cal State system. And, and you know, I spoke to HSU provost Jen Caps, who said that this polytechnic designation could be what pushes them out of all of these different enrollment declines and budget deficits and, and all this, you know, these scenarios. Um, so, yeah, so right now, I think it's this semester, they are working on a, a self-study report. So they're going to outline um, how they meet the standards of a polytechnic university. Um, so they're going to look at their academics, they're going to look at their facilities, their budget, and, and all these types of different things and put it into a report and then send it off to the chancellor's office to ask the board to actually approve the designation or not. Um, and so I think this is a, a huge push for, for HSU, for sure. Oh, right on. Um, from your article, it sounded like HSU is a really good fit for this Polytech designation, just based on kind of what's already, uh, you know, the programs that are there. Can you tell us a little bit about the, why it's such a yeah. good fit? Or- yeah, sure. So HSU is like, it's number one when it comes to students majoring in a science degree. Like we are the top school in the CSU system that has the most students majoring in a science field. Um, And of course, you know, HSU has a really good um, natural sciences program. Like we've we've been distinguished for that or not we, sorry, I went to HSU. So I feel (laughs) like, you know, um, and I graduated from there and I was not a, a science major, but that's a whole different story. (laughs) <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, so HSU has a really, a really good uh, natural sciences program. And so that's already, um, you know, they've got that in the bag. They just have to elaborate on how they're going to um, introduce applied sciences and, and engineering and technology to the mix. Um, yeah. Right on. Mm-hmm. So also, um, you mentioned that there's an issue with uh, HSU funding that has to do with declining enrollment and then, of course, COVID. Um, how might this designation help with that yeah. problem? Yeah. So, OK, so when I was talking to Jen Caps, she said that a lot of students, you know, um, they want um, that prestige that comes from a polytechnic <clears throat> university. And I actually... Um, got in contact with a recruitment officer or recruitment, not recruitment officer, I'm so sorry, Um, an admissions counselor who helps students apply to colleges. And I asked her, is this like a real, is there a prestige to Polytechnic University? And she said, yeah. She said that, you know, the students she's helping are um, really looking for those STEM degrees, right? And, And making, and coming in with Polytechnics in mind. Um, and so 
there's all these students that want to attend these schools, but there are only a few of them in the C or a couple of them in the CSU system. So with the hope of of getting more students and, you know, they all pay tuition and fees, you know, that would make the budget healthier. And so that would get them out of, you know, these deficits and, and they would be able to expand on even more programs on top of um, polytechnic studies. And so like with only two in the Cal State system plus uh, Caltech out there also, yeah. there's a demand side. So it actually, I think you, you mentioned, it's like there's an overflow, like a, yeah. a natural process would bring more people here. Yes, and especially because Cal Poly San Luis Obispo has a really low acceptance rate. I think it's like 20 something percent. Um, so a lot of people who want to go into those STEM degrees, you know, might not get in if they don't have a really, really competitive application. Um, and then, you know, there's Cal Poly Pomona who has a, a, a higher acceptance rate, but all of their STEM majors um, are impacted. So they also have to um, come in with the highly competitive application. So if there was another option and, and if some, they want, if students wanted to stay in the CSU system, then HSU might be the place that they can go to and they can apply to. And so, um, yeah. So that leads to the other side of the coin, which is the impact of this might have on our community. So if suddenly yeah. we're the third in the system and we're getting lots of overflow students, how, what would that look like from the perspective of the community with all, potentially many more students coming here on like yeah, housing, so, for example? Mm -hmm, yeah, so that's exactly what I outline in the story of how in the in 2015, 2016 school year, like HSU had hit its highest enrollment that caused so many housing problems. So Jen Caps told me that that is another aspect that they're gonna look into in the self-study report. She said that they're gonna look at what is a healthy enrollment for HSU, you know, what's respectful to the community, you know, so that we don't get into the, or so that the school doesn't get into these housing problems. Um, and they're also gonna outline if they get this many students, here are the potential housing uh, buildings we can have yeah no, so it's one of those things where we may not mm -hmm. i say we I'm, I'm doing what you do now i'm saying we yeah. our, com <laughs> our community might benefit yeah. from the school getting this new designation increased interest mm -hmm. lots more students mm -hmm. um but in addition to more people there's more funding potential too and so you outlined a few of those can you tell us about like some yeah. of the new avenues for funding yeah partnerships and, and, and that's the thing about, you know, polytechnic universities is that they have a lot more robust funding and, and, and partnerships with like federal agencies and state agencies. And it's just going to expand a lot of, of, of different types of things. So, for example, I think I gave um, Cal Poly's College of Agriculture and Engineering, they got, um, I think, a grant from a business on, on making, on researching healthy, um, not healthy, um, organic food um, soil production or something like that. And so these are the types of, of partnerships that HSU will probably see if they're designated a polytechnic university. Yeah, this is great. I think you also mentioned um, that the university would then be in a position to get governmental research grants and things like that. So yeah, it's a whole bunch of mm -hmm. new potential budgetary relief. Yeah, it's, it's, Jen Caps did say that she really hopes that this is going to push them out of, out of all of that, all of the mess, or I guess, you know. Fantastic. Well, I guess, mm -hmm. um, you know, you'll continue to follow this and keep us Definitely. posted on progress. Um, how about you, Jen? Uh, what are you covering this week on the Arts and Features beat? Well, um, if Listening to the talk of college admissions didn't already make us feel old, David. <laughs> yeah. It has been 21 years since the Mattol Valley in Petrolia specifically got a skate ramp. So if you've driven through, what is with Petrolia? Please explain to me <laughs> how you're driving through Petrolia and all of a sudden there's like zebras <laughs> over here and then there's like a skate ramp in the middle of the woods. I don't understand it, but I kind of love it. You know, um, how did we end up with a, I, the zebras are a whole other story that I'm gonna have to investigate, but how we ended up with a skate ramp with a half pipe in, um, in the middle of Petrolia, which is 
a very small population. I am very glad that I didn't have to find out. Tamar Burris did a wonderful freelance article for us about how this whole thing happened, you know, 21 years ago. And what it started with was there's a fellow named Dave Grant, who is a lifelong skater. And he had a couple kids, moved to the area in like 96, and then was like, well, where are we going to let the kids skate, right? And they were skating at the school, having a good time. But then after a while, you know, as interest grows and you start to see more and more kids skateboarding, you know, the natural impulse is to say, you kids with your skateboards, <laughs> get the hell out of here. Um, in fact, it was a liability issue, right? If somebody falls, injures themselves on school property and they're not insured for this sort of activity, it could be a big deal. So um, they were like, yeah, you can't skate here. So the kids started skating over by the general store, less safe. Um, so, you know, there started to be like this, you know, hunt for a place to have these kids skate. And what uh, Tamar found out was that there's a woman named Bev Haywood not a skater, um, but somebody who cared about the kids' safety and who came up with the idea of like, well, you know, if there was a 4-H club for skating, then they could be covered and at the school and everything. And to my mind, when I first saw this, I was like, 4-H and skating, I don't see it. But in fact, there is precedent. There's one other school um, in Montana, of all places, Um didn't know there was a lot of skate culture in Montana, <laughs> but apparently there was precedent. And so they were able to set up this 4-H club. And that meant that the school not only let them skate there, but let them stash equipment and stuff like that. Um, and that was great for a while. And um, Tamar points out that, in fact, there are only about 800 residents or there were about only 800 residents at the time. So like a dozen kids being interested. That's a big deal. Um, and they started thinking, well, we need a, you know, we need a better setup than this. And then Dave Grant ended up being a mentor in their, you know, mentorship project thing, which I guess is, you know, a high school opportunity to work with somebody in the community on, you know, working with an adult on a, a real project. And, um, this kid, ha ha ha. Adam Neal, 20 years ago he was a kid, now he's a grown man somewhere. <laughs> 20 years. Um, I'm looking at these years and it's like 1998. I'm like, please, I still have jeans from 1998. <laughs> I don't wear them out. Um, but anyway, he designed, you know, a half pipe setup, and they figured out, well, like, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can actually design this thing. Maybe we can build it. But if you just built one like Napoleon Dynamite style and just like, you know, set up whatever wobbly thing, it's not going to last. So Bev Haywood stepped in again and she was like, you know, let's bring this to a fundraising event. And she set up like an ice cream parlor or she helped set up an ice cream parlor where they were raising money. And then people just started kicking in. Um, people started writing checks. People started donating. And pretty soon they had money for uh, with a couple of bigger donors, too. Um, they had money for something called a skate light surface. So a real surface that is not just plywood and going to rot away, break, et cetera, but something that you can skate on for years and years and years. It turns out two decades. And they have, so now, you know, they do the maintenance and whatnot through a GoFundMe, um, which is pretty incredible to see the way, you know, a community comes together around this. And it's not even just skating. Um, Tamar sent me see these great photos uh, from somebody who is also a skater. Um, the photo credit we had is for uh, Cosmo Free, who is a parent, I think Cosmo Free works at a local skate shop, I think. Um, anyway, there, there's a picture of like some events, some skate competitions, there's a graffiti artist working. You know, there's crowds of families watching, and it really became this sort of community hub. And you kind of see how something where, you know, in in theory, you think to yourself, like, oh, kids skateboarding. That's like a, a lot of people look at that as a menace, as a, you know, as a safety hazard, as a, you know, car. somebody's going to hit them with a car. It's a problem. But instead, this community embraced this idea pitched in together with their own funding um, and made this thing happen that turned out to benefit the whole community. It turns into kind of a gathering place. 
And, you know, it wouldn't have survived 21 years if it didn't mean something to people there. Um, it's pretty great. And, you know, I love this photo of this graffiti artist in the foreground painting and then the this kid doing this death defying thing that I hope I never have to try. It was just, you know, bands would show up. It's, it's a very cool, very cool thing. And yeah, it's just one of those weird, weird little humble um, community get together stories about how, yeah, how people here come together for sometimes not the thing you expect. Right. You know, as I've said before, somehow we ended up with a lot of steel drum. <laughs> Somehow we ended up with zebras. It's, it's a testament to you know community involvement because it's just a handful of people that pulled it off and made it happen. And like you said, 20 years later, you're driving on that awesome uh, Lost Coast tour of Lost Coast a lot, and then you see this the skate ramp that you're like, I wonder how that got here. Now we know the story behind the story. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Yeah, go go check it out either you know online to uh, starting Thursday or you know grab the paper and read it because it's it's pretty great. And like you said, if you do see the skate ramp in real life, keep going to the coast, a little past down, you know, central town there. You can see the zebras. I, I, I have a witness who testified they just saw them. Yeah, they're real. They're out there. They're on that awesome drive. So check it out. It's a hidden gem. <laughs> and so, Jen, you're working on something else. You've got this meditations that is that won't quit. Can you tell us a little yes. bit about that, please? I think anybody at the journal can tell you that if you are looking for a way to find peace and calm, um, I am not the person you should ask. Um, but, um, and you know, as I was recently telling someone, I, I actually used to take these like meditative walks that my doctor prescribed to me for stress. And I had a little alarm that would go off to tell me to go on my meditative walk. And I think everyone in the office knew it was when my, meditative walks were supposed to happen because there would just be a stream of cursing from my <laughs> office because it's time for now I have to leave what I'm in the middle of and uh, and I would just go out and stomp through the streets of Old Town for 10 minutes and come back no better off but um, because of my you know complete lack of qualification for giving this kind of advice I wrote a satirical piece this week about meditations for hitting the pandemic wall um, I don't know if you've been reading articles or seeing people talking about hitting the wall with the pandemic. Um, oh, yeah. but it, yeah, it turns out that if you put people in like, you know, lockdown light for almost a year, we get a little crazy. Um, go figure. Yeah. We get a little stressed out and there are of course, serious, serious impacts, um, to the COVID-19 I, there's not, there's just a disaster at this point. It's beyond just pandemic, right? Because we've got people who have, of course, we have people who've died. We have people who've, you know, have been impacted by those deaths. We have the massive economic fallout. We have a mental health crisis. Um, you know, we have kids who are suffering either from being out of school and away from important services. All those things are happening. So, of course, I'm like, well, why don't I write something funny about that? Um, but essentially, um, I'm just writing these little meditations as a way to vent the frustrations of partly the frustrations of we're 11 months into this and people are still wearing their masks under their nose at the supermarket. Um, people are still ignoring rules. I'm still out and seeing people who cannot eyeball six feet. <laughs> you know who you are. You know who you are. Um <laughs> Six feet is not what you think it is. I, I mean, it's my fault. I lie about my height. I'm one of those people. But we need to be honest about the six feet distance. Um, and then, you know, somewhat being the frustration of people who are just frustrated. Um, because on the one hand, I get it. I'm, I'm in the same boat in terms of, you know, feeling like, is this ever going to end, you know? Um, in a lot of ways, I'm really lucky. I'm able to work. My job is a job that um, I'm able to do remotely. And so I am deeply blessed with that. But it is extremely frustrating seeing people just being tired of following the rules that are about pleasure, about you know denying yourself the pleasure of someone's company or denying yourself the pleasure of travel or of 
different luxuries, I find it insane that we can put that ahead of our fellow human beings' well-being, that we can put, you know, my desire to live it without fear. Go ahead. I have a meditation for that, too. Go ahead and live without fear in some other way. You know, go on a trail full of mountain lions and sit there with a bucket of chicken and live your bravest life, but maybe not in a way that will spread disease and kill me or someone I love. Um, so, yeah, it's basically just a frustration vent. And But I think we're all kind of, we feel like we're in the, at the end of our rope. Um, not all of us are, but some of us really are at the end of our ropes. And it's up to those of us who have a little more rope left to to really try and end this thing because not everybody's going to be able to hang on that much longer. True words, right? So one of the, one of the pieces of advice that I know you had in there was just breathe. Sometimes just, just breathing is really helpful. And even though this is tongue in cheek, your article, of course, like that's actually sage advice for people. Yeah, but don't breathe too much. <laughs> Not too deeply, and don't exhale too strongly, and maybe breathe through two masks. Right. That would be great if you, if you could. <laughs> I'll do my part, I promise. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, definitely. Um, that's about going to do it for us this week. North Coast Journal is on newsstands now. Pick one up. Stay informed. Also, online. Uh, if nothing else, uh, read those meditations, uh, because they're hysterical. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Iridium, Jennifer. I appreciate Thank you guys you. so much. Talk to you guys again soon uh, next week. Take care. Till then. Bye, guys. All right. Bye. Two masks. Two masks. Mm -hmm.